comes to studying doctrine and everything, Mariology, the study behind uh, Mary. And, uh, you know, the, so the title of the message, SSPX, Their Lady. We talked about their rock on the last Sunday and how their rock's not our rock. Uh, it's not as our rock. And here, their lady, you'll see a lot of times, uh, our lady of the Our Lady of such and such, or whatever you'll know, that's probably Catholic uh, uh, church or or even a city or something like that. And uh, we're going to St. Mary's. I wonder why they named the town St. Mary's. Okay, <laughs> you know. And uh, there's a big place in the center of town that I keep talking about. And by the way, I keep getting a lot of my facts wrong, and I'm sorry about that. I've been trying to figure out if I should go back and see what all I said wrong, and then just correct it. Just know this, if you go back to previous messages, I've probably got a lot of facts wrong here and there, uh, particularly about that building, and I talked about you know, 4,000 people meeting in there, and, and I, the truth is, I don't even think it's done yet. <laughs> okay, it's, it's closed from what I understand. I don't even think it's finished being built, so I guess what I was reading about had to do with another building, and, and then they only said like 1,000 or 2,000 or something like that, so I don't know where the 4,000 came from. I'm kind of confused on it, uh, but that, none of that's what I'm getting at is that this building they're building in the middle of town there, so it's a huge work. People from all over the world are like tuning in to see how it's going. What did I say last week? 50,000, I mean, $50 million uh, so far has been raised for it. And uh, it's called the Immaculata. And this, I'll talk about the uh, Immaculate Conception later on, but the Immaculata is specifically talking about Mary. And so you think about St. Mary's is the name of the town we're going to. Uh, you know, there's they talk a lot about Our Lady. There's going to be statues of Mary everywhere. There's this place called the Immaculata, which, by the way, very top of, of the building there, that center structure that goes up the highest, there's like a little dome. And on top of that, yeah, there's crucifixes all around and crosses and stuff. But on the top of this thing, as high as you can go, is a statue of Mary. And so, obviously, this is going to be a big thing in the town uh, that we're going to. And it's a big a huge thing in the Catholic faith. And by the way, uh, don't be don't be fooled. There are plenty of quote unquote Protestants that really elevate Mary to a position that's higher than what the Bible actually teaches as well. Uh, Luther himself, I think, did. I don't. I'm not super familiar with his uh, his teachings. The reason I had Brother Austin to read from those two passages, if you didn't catch it, probably you did. But if you didn't catch it, uh, these are two instances where. Uh, Jesus is dealing with somebody talking about his mother, and he's dealing with them in front of everybody else. And you would think if she has that role that the Catholics believe that she has and, that, and thinks that Jesus wanted her to have, he would not have acted and responded the way that he did. Okay, and Both of those texts is really a powerful, I, I believe, really powerful uh, example of how Jesus felt about Mary. Did he love her? Of course. Did he respect her as his mother? Yes. He obeyed her growing up and of course he didn't ever sin, so of course he obeyed his parents, but uh, unless they told him to do something that was outside of God's will, he said, you know, I gotta I'm doing my father's business, right? And so, <clears throat> talking about the father in heaven. And so uh, you know, obviously he respected her at the end of his life. He said to John, you know, hey John, behold your mother and to his mother, behold, your son, talking about John. Now, they take that and say that was Jesus saying, you know, basically that she's our mother. She's the mother of the church. You know, behold, John, this is your mother. And so just like that's supposed to apply to the church. And they really take this doc these doctrine, these teachings, uh, <coughs> to this extreme uh, level, as we'll see in the message here. But Jesus, how did he respond? They said, hey, behold, your mother and your, and, and your brother are without you know, he didn't say, like, everybody stop what you're doing. Stop. Bow down. My mother's coming into the room. He didn't say that. He said, in fact, what he said comes across as being kind of rude. Uh, I don't believe he was ever disrespectful to his mother, so I think you have to read into what exactly he's doing and why he's doing it. And I don't think he's being rude, but he says, who are my mother and my brother? And he said, behold, my mother and my brother. For those who do the uh, will of my father are my the same are my brother and, and my mother. I misquoted that a little bit, um, but you know that the, the implication he's saying, like, you know, hey, this is my family. Those who do what I tell them to do and follow me, that's my family. He was all about getting these disciples and training them and getting them ready, for, so whenever he went up to heaven, uh, you know, they could continue the work that he had called them to do. 
preaching the gospel and what have you. But look, he didn't stop and say, everyone stop what you're doing, bow down to my mother. Later on, when somebody says, blessed are, uh, blessed is the, the woman who's perhaps I, I sucked or whatever. Well, that was like the first adoration, uh, uh, exaltation of Mary. You know what I mean? That's like the first Catholic uh, act that you see in the Bible. And what does he say? He was like, ah, yay, rather blessed are those who do the will of the Father. You know, again, I think I misquoted it, but you, the point was that he's, he's making it very clear. Like, hey, focus your attention on me. Focus on your attention on those who would do the work that I call them to do and the gospel and all that kind of stuff. Don't get sidetracked on venerating my mother. You know, I, I believe that's the issue. Now, just me saying that would offend Catholics dearly, and they would probably say, let it be anathema, and, and uh, you know, I'd probably uh, spend another thousand years in purgatory by their doctrine. But <laughs> there's no purgatory. Okay, I don't have time to preach everything. <laughs> but uh, but uh, there's no purgatory in the Bible. And they would say, oh, yeah, well, not your Bible, because you took out the Apocrypha, but it's in our Bible, and so, like, too much to talk about here. We're talking about their lady, okay? Uh, and how could you say their lady? Well, because it's not our lady, right? She's, she's the mother of Jesus. She's blessed. I will agree with that. You know, when she said, or when Elizabeth said, hey, blessed, you know, you, you're, what a blessed position to be able to carry Jesus in her womb. I agree with that. What a what a position. I suspect she was a very godly lady. Uh, why would he have chosen her? You know, I suspect that there's a lot of great things that we could say about her, but they take it to us to you know above and beyond in this step. So if you ask any Catholic, because look, I was talking about this before you know, before we went out soul winning, we were talking about some of the things I've been studying and and everything, and, and I was saying this, you know, really, to be quite honest with you, we do often misrepresent what a lot of Catholics believe, because it's just lack of knowledge, we just don't understand, and so we perceive things, or we read into it, or whatever, a lot of things that we attribute to them believing or doing, they would never say that they do that, and maybe they don't do it necessarily, but we just kind of perceive it, or whatever. So we got to be careful about how we do say these things. But if you went to a Catholic and said, why do you guys worship Mary? You know, they'd probably laugh at you and say, you think that we worship Mary? We don't worship Mary. How many of you have ever gotten that conversation with somebody? We do not worship Mary, is what they'll say. Now they'll say, we venerate her. And I would say, if you go to the dictionary and look up worship, you're going to find one of the definitions in there is going to say venerate. If you look up what venerate, one of the definitions in there is going to say worship. Okay, because it's basically the same thing. And let me prove that real quick. Go to Luke chapter 14. I guess you probably have to have King James Bible to see this, but... Even the King James translators, let's put it this way, use the word worship in a way that somebody else might say, that's not worship, that's veneration. Luke chapter, what did I say, 14. And look at, starting in verse 10. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee come in, uh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Now, I don't think he'd be saying, like, hey, don't you want, some, don't you want people to worship you? You know, so go ahead and take the lowest seat so that he can put you in the highest seat and you can have people worship you. Right? That's what he says, that you might receive worship. But he's not talking about actual, like, worshiping the way that you worship God. He's just talking about bowing down and, 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 and uh, exalting and honoring and stuff like that. Okay, Now, definitely, we shouldn't do that to men to a great level either. And, and we got to be careful. You know, kind of like Mordecai didn't bow down to Haman, right? He's like, I'm not going to bow down to somebody and, and venerate them in an unhealthy way, in an unnatural way. But there's just nothing wrong with showing respect to somebody. Okay, so if they want to play that definition game, we can say like, well, how do you mean? How do you know that by worship, I don't mean <laughs> venerate? Okay, uh, but here's here's the question. So you might say, well, do they worship her the same way uh, that they worship God? Well, I'm gonna talk about this more here in a second. But all you can go by, you know, who cares what somebody says? All you can go by is what you observe with your eyes, right, and what you know. So. 
so when we get to St. Mary's, you're going to see a lot of what we would identify as Mary worship. There's going to be statues everywhere. Uh, there's going to be, you know, depictions. I was talking, I was again reading about that Immaculata, that the church building, I guess they call it a church building, uh, that's in that center of the town there. It's, it's so they're putting all this money to it. It's this beautiful building. And all over the top, you know, they have artwork at the top, and there's all these in, this imagery that they literally, uh, you know, talk about. Like there's like two part uh, series on the artwork in the Immaculata and how all these depictions are imagery of Mary. And some of them aren't like pictures of her, they're just like different different things in the Bible. For example, uh, one of them is a picture of this garden. And he says, uh, so if you go to, we call it Song of Solomon, they call it canta cantations, as I say, it, cantations. Which, if you go to an even old like replica of the 1611, like that's what the Song of Solomon is called, like can, Cantations of Cantation, or the Cantation of Cantations, something like that. Song of Songs, the same is what it means. And uh, and so uh, in that passage, I mean, in that book is a letter, right? And there's this talk, Solomon's talking about his, to his wife, and his wife is talking to Solomon, and there's this place where she talks about herself, and it says, uh, Thy, thy sister, you know, is as such and such in several places. And so there's a place where she's talking about thy sister is like this garden and all this. And they just take that and say, hey, this, that's a, a, a picture of Mary. And so then there's this picture in there that they look at that and say, hey, when you read Song of Solomon, you see Mary. When you see, they look at, they went to Genesis where Jacob has his dream and it's called Jacob's Ladder. Have you ever seen that? He dreams, and the, and the Bible talks about how he, in his dream he sees this ladder, and the angels are going up and down. And uh, he wakes up, he's like, surely I'm in the presence of, of God. Well, that ladder, one of the images in there is a picture of this ladder, Jacob's ladder. And they said, that's imagery. That's a, that's a picture of Mary and going up and down, you know, to the Father. And, and that ladder represents and that, uh, going out to all these features of the ladder, and she's this and she's that. And uh, there's this place, I mean, there's many, many different things in there that they talk about. And one of the things is, and this shouldn't be surprising, this is something that's talked about a lot when it comes to uh, discussing Mary from the Bible. Because let's be honest, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about Mary. It just really doesn't. There's very few chapters or even verses that talk about her. But one thing that you may mention, they'll make mention a lot is, is Genesis 3.15. Let's go there. <clears throat> Genesis 3.15. So this is a story, obviously, Eve eats of the forbidden fruit, gives it to her husband, and, uh, and now they've got, you know, they can't hide it from God, of course, and so now he's punishing them. He punishes the man, and he punishes the woman, and then he punishes the serpent. And uh, in 15, he says, verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I want to stop there just for a second and show you something. You say, okay, so that's a picture of, of Mary. How is that a picture of Mary? Well, because they say that the... That, that, the seed. All right. Well, let me just let me just show you this. Okay. So, if you had if you have a Dewey rings, first of all, what did the King James say? It said, it says, it shall bruise. All right. Let's look at it again. I will put in between between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. What's it referring to? It's the seed of the woman, right? It that seed. Okay. Now. The Dewey Reeves, that's the original Catholic Bible. Uh, it has actually, now they've allowed other versions, modern versions of the Bible, but here's something you can always go to. They cannot deny the Dewey Reeves because it has been quoted by popes and it has, you know, certain things have been put into place where you can't say, well, yeah, but modern scholars have figured out, no, no, no. Whatever the Dewey Reeves says, they've got, now they might be able to explain and say like some, 
scholars say this and that, but they will never deny what the Dewey Ring says. It's very important because it's 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 uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's like it's it's it's, in, it's established okay as the word of God to them. So this is why it's important. Like I, I believe it would be helpful to learn some of those verses that we quote from the gospel and, and, and different things. It would be helpful to find out what it says in the Dewey Reams. You might be surprised. It's pretty close. You know, it's not like you're reading an entirely different, like the Book of Mormon or something like that. No, it's it's all based on the same scriptures, with the exception of the Apocrypha, which we reject as. Uh, which, by the way, some of the books of the Apocrypha they they reject as as well as far as canon, but they don't think it's canon of scripture, uh, but they just still put importance on it and believe that it is accurate. Uh, but if you know what the Dewey Ring says, you would actually be able to maybe make some arguments to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like hey, this isn't just my Bible. I don't have a Bible that teaches something different. Even in your Dewey Rings, I can show you what the Bible says. It's probably helpful to look some of that up. You got one, didn't you, just to, for that very purpose. And so it would be neat to, uh, to find that out. So what does the Dewey Ring say? <laughs> King James said, it shall bruise thy head. Okay, it, the seed. The Dewey Ring says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. So it's it's not saying it, it's saying she. Okay. So what do a lot of Protestants do? A lot of Protestants say, hey, that's blasphemous. Because it's not she, it's not Eve, it's not Mary, it's not, it's Jesus. So almost every modern version, if you look it up, even New King James, uh, which is a modern version, don't let anyone deceive you. Uh, it's based on a lot of the same text, in, in fact, that the other modern translations use. Uh, but they claim, no, it's just the same as the King James. We just uh, updated it a little bit. It's, it's, that's, that's true. That's true because it's not. Okay, the New King James says the same thing. It says, he shall bruise thy head. Okay, so here's what they're doing. They're taking this logical jump, and they're saying, like, well, the seed is talking about Jesus Christ. And so they're saying, like, hey, the Satan, Satan's going to bruise your heel, but he, Jesus, the seed of the woman, is going to, uh, to bruise Satan's head. So logical thing to do is start questioning, was the King James right when it says it? Surely it's not talking about Jesus calling him an it, right? And so they changed it to he in the modern, modern versions. <clears throat> so interestingly, you can go to the, to the Dewey Reams. You can go to modern versions. You can go to just any Bible out there, and it's probably going to quote this scripture pretty much right, which is Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Let's look there. Romans 16, 20. I know I'm getting a little off, uh, maybe off course a bit, but remember, they're using Genesis 3, 15 as an as a imagery of Mary. And, uh, and so I want to just point this out because I, I kind of found this out whenever I was reading all these, and I was like, man, this is a huge, this is huge. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 16, look at verse 20. This is how Paul's ending this uh, uh, this chap this chap I mean this book here. He says, "In the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly." The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Who is he talking about? Your. He's talking about the church. Okay. I don't mean the Catholic Church. I mean the church. Those. What is the church? The church is those people who have believed in the Lord, and then now they congregate together to do the work of the Lord. Okay. So we believe in local churches. Uh, you know, technically, if we all got into one place as the body of Christ, and and one day in heaven we will be the church. Okay. Uh, right now, we exist in a lot of local bodies where people get together and they're on board and they're, you know, uh, uh, doing the work of the Lord and, and following the commandments and, and, and doing what they can as a church. But what puts them into that church is their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, and then of course we baptize believers not for their salvation, but to kind of as a way of adding them to the church and saying, hey, we're going to now uh, be united and we're professing Christ and we're going to go out and do this work. And so that's the church. And so when he's talking to, to the church here at Rome, he could have been talking to any church and say, hey, uh, God is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And here's what he's saying. As the seed of Satan tries to destroy the church 
through persecution, right, through tribulation, through through all these things, and he tries to destroy the church. Guess what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16? He said, and again, almost all modern versions are going to say this, right, I will build my church. Even the Dewey Reams, I need to look and see exactly what it says, but you know how they believe that thou, you are the rock, Peter, or, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And we have a different interpretation of that, but it still says the same thing. And here's what he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 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 The seed, you know, is going to bruise uh, Satan's, Satan's head. It's the church. Now, God does it. God bruises Satan under our feet because we're just doing, it's Christ's church, right? But we are the church that is following Christ, and he's going to bruise Satan's head under our feet. I just thought that was pretty cool whenever I read that. Okay, so uh, so don't, you know, don't make, don't make uh, Genesis 3.15 a reference to Mary. I don't even have time to get into Revelation with the, uh, the woman. You know, it's been interpreted uh, different ways of who that woman is that runs into the wilderness, and, and then they see her in heaven, and she's got the 12 stars and all that. The Catholic Church makes that Mary, but it's not a, uh, there's, you know, I can spend a little bit of time telling my, my views on that, but it's not really important. There's a lot of different views on who that is. Okay? Um, so, what do they... What are what do they do with Mary? Are they actually worshiping her like God? I I would say no. Now obviously some are. Some don't have a clue. Some worship angels, right? And they just put them and they pray to them and and they think these angels are going to save. Okay. And a, most Catholics, I, I think that actually know Catholic doctrines would say, hey, those people are wrong. They're not supposed to be doing that. I really think that most of them would. I'm I'm just I'm just saying. I think if you listen to them try to explain, they would say, we don't worship Mary in that way. We don't actually make her to be God uh, and all. So, but here's what I want to ask. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, but all we can do is go off of observation. And maybe I know a little bit about their teaching and I've been studying this and maybe I know what they would say, how they feel about Mary and, and, and all this, you know, uh, but what does it look like to anybody that doesn't know that? What does it look like to those average person that knows nothing about Catholicism and they just go in and say, man, I've been noticing that, you know, this town, it just seems like they worship Mary. You know, wouldn't they say that? I mean, they like, like, is Mary their God or, or what is it? Is that their idol? And, and you say, you know, so a Catholic might say, hey, they're wrong for doing that if they, if they do that. Yeah, but it, shouldn't it be important? Like, like, you know, what's in your heart kind of comes out by your actions. You know, that's just what people would think, see, that they would observe. And so they would see that and they would wonder that. Now, <clears throat> there's also, uh, there's also, okay, oh, here's what I was going to say, okay. So one of the ways I've heard it explained, which kind of makes sense, and again, if you hear people, if you hear a Catholic apologist Meaning somebody who not makes their apologies like like I'm sorry, but apologists meaning that they're they're explaining why they do what they do and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you hear a Catholic apologist, you know, talking about these things, a lot of times you can listen to them and be like, hey, that kind of makes sense actually. I never really thought of it that way, and kind of dismiss some of these things. But it's not until you actually step back and you look at the history and you look at all the things that have been done and you look at the teachings and you look at what it looks like from the outside looking in that you're like, I don't care what you say about what we're actually meaning. What are you doing? Like, what does it look like? I mean, there's a presence here. There's a there's a feeling as you walk into this building, and Mary's at the top of the building, and you walk in, and there's just pictures about Mary everywhere. It looks to me like you're worshiping Mary, I mean, regardless of what you might try to uh, try to say. So one of the things I'll say is, okay, when you look in the book of Kings, and I've preached on this before, right? On Mother's Day, I preached about the mothers of the kings. You look at the kings, and it always tells you the kings, and then it says, and, their, and his mother's name was, and, uh, and, and this, 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 you know, the mother of the king had an important part. I don't want to say that she was necessarily an advisor, but she kind of had that role, like, hey, it's an honored position, you're the mother of the king, and, uh, and so it even mentions her name and then in the list as it's going through the kings. And so they say, look, that's all it is. Mary is just the mother 
of Jesus Christ, and so therefore, uh, you know, we give her this honor, and when we pray to her, we're not asking her to do things, we're just asking her to go to her father, just like, I mean, just to her son, uh, just like, you know, when when people wanted to get uh, to David, what did they do? They went to, to Bathsheba, and as soon as Solomon becomes the king, they're still going to Bathsheba saying, hey, will you ask Solomon, you know? Uh, what about uh, I can't remember his name, but he's wanting to he's wanting to marry uh, somebody. He's like, will you go ask Solomon if I can marry uh, the Shudamite? And so, you know, he's, they're like, that's all we're doing when we when we talk to Mary and and we want to go to him. It's just like that. Okay, so now let me ask you this. So let's say the Queen of Sheba came to go came to visit Solomon. Want to see how magnificent this kingdom was that everybody keeps talking about? And when she went in there, all we saw was just pictures of Bathsheba everywhere. And little statues of Bathsheba. <laughs> and like the name Bathsheba everywhere. Like, like he's like, yeah, we named this temple Our Lady Bathsheba. <laughs> you know? And it's just like all this, like, what would they think? Like, man, they've got an unhealthy relationship <laughs> with the king's mother. Right? Because it's all about the king. It's not about her mother. So from the outside looking in, no matter who you are, you're thinking, man, they got an unhealthy relationship with Mary that Jesus never asked them to have. Right. In fact, it's very clear with those passages that we start out. Jesus was like, hey, yeah, actually more important are those people who actually follow me and do what I told them to do. You know, but you're my brother, you're my mother. That would be offensive if, if that was actually that position that they give Mary. But it goes a little bit farther, uh, you know, so let me just dig a little bit deeper. So how about the titles that they give Mary? Now, I'm okay with the Virgin Mary. I, I talk about the Virgin Mary all the time when I'm giving the gospel. I, I want people to know, hey, you ever wonder why Mary was a virgin? You know, uh, uh, you know. I, in fact, I often reference the Catholic belief because everyone says, oh, you know, the Catholics are all about the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary. I'm like, well, you ever thought about why that's even important? And uh, so I'll mention that. I don't even mind that they call her the Blessed Mother. I really don't. I suppose you could, I could probably dig in and try to find some reason not to call her that. But look, she was blessed to be able to carry Jesus, and, and that was a wonderful thing. I don't mind that. But here are some other titles that they call her. The Mother of God. Okay, This is actually a doctrine that was put into Catholic dogma that's, uh, that's called the Fia, I don't think I wrote it down, but I can't remember, but the God-bearer. And, uh, and so basically it's saying that she had God in her womb. Now, I'm going to give a pass on that because of the fact that, okay, you can convince me, and I know what the doctrine is saying, Jesus is God. They, when they wrote that, when they gave her that name, they were just saying, uh, you know, hey, he is deity, and, she, and he was actually incarnate. He was God-man inside her womb. I agree with that. I'm not, I'm not going to make a big deal about that. I wouldn't call her the mother of God, though, because that's confusing. Because God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Most time we say God, we're talking about the Father, and we're talking about the not the man, Jesus Christ. We're talking about the God of the universe, you know, God, Father, God, Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and by calling her mother of God, again, what is appearance? What does that look like? That looks like we're elevating Mary on a pretty high, high level. But then I'll give you another title. You'll see this a lot. Queen of heaven. You ever heard of that? The queen of heaven. That's a title that was given to uh, to Mary. Go to Jeremiah 44. I honestly haven't heard uh, a Catholic defend this, but I'm, but I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't, I just haven't heard it yet. So whenever I find that out, I'll probably be like, oh, that's what they say about that. But Jeremiah chapter 44. Isaiah, Jeremiah, And let me say, I'm not preaching this about the SSPX or about the Catholics so that we will go door to door and be like, you know, hey, I crushed that idol outside. <laughs> you know, what are you doing worshiping Mary? And all that. That's not my that's not my intention. Okay, a lot of people are deceived. They don't understand what they're doing. Uh, we want to love them. We want to give them the gospel. We're not going there trying to be offensive. Why do you worship Mary? And trying to start an argument or something like that. But I want you to know why they're doing what they're doing and how they're confused and the danger of what they're doing and be able to present and an, an, give an answer because I've knocked on doors of people who are devout Catholics who actually said, well, let me ask you a question. 
why don't you do this and why don't you do that and start throwing out all these things that the Catholics do and I'm thinking like why would I want to do that but to them it's an important deal right and they don't understand they think we're heretics for not doing it and so it's kind of nice to be able to give them an answer politely right I get a little riled up uh, and start wanting to even make fun of them and stuff like that whenever I'm studying it but look we want to get people saved and we don't want them to be deceived by this stuff so we want to do it politely and gently and let them know, like, hey, I do have a reason that I don't do that. Because Jesus never asked me to do it and, and, and things like that. Okay, so uh, so look at Jeremiah 44, look at verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even of all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever things goeth forth out of our own mouth, and uh, uh, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the city of, cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victual, victuals, yeah, and were well and saw no evil but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine see what they're saying like we want to burn incense to the queen of heaven we want to do all these things and what they're talking about is a false god and they call her queen of heaven you know and uh, i think recently i said something about diana being called queen of heaven and i i can't remember i, I believe that's one of her titles Okay, so interestingly enough, a lot of Mariology came out of the council at Ephesus, and a lot of tradition and, and, and beliefs about that, uh, about Mary, came from Ephesus, which is very ironic, because that's where they had the Temple of Diana, that's where all these people worshipped the goddess Diana. And so, uh, so very interesting how this name that's given to her is a name that's also given to goddess and false god, and so, uh, so very interesting that they're doing that. And then all the statues of Mary everywhere. I already talked about that. And then when they're bowing down, which by the way, the definition of worship is to bow down. <laughs> okay. When they're bowing down to her and they're weeping and crying in her name. And, uh, and, and you know, certain parts of the world had a statue of Mary that started supposedly crying. You heard of that? And so everybody just went crazy with this miracle and this idol, you know, began to. You know, they wouldn't call an idol, but it's just a statue of, and then they put all this reverence to this, this, this statue. And God doesn't, he talks a lot about that throughout the Bible, about not giving yourself to idols and graven images. And I know they'll say, but yeah, but we're not worshiping, and we're not making these our gods and worshiping. It sure looks like it. It sure looks like there's a lot of worship going on, there's a lot of praising and crying and and doing all this stuff. And they say, look, hey, we're trying to intercede. We're trying to ask her to intercede and go to Christ. Christ never told you to do that. The Bible says we can go boldly before the throne and we can just make our petitions known. Now, do we ever ask somebody to pray for us? Because this is what they'll say. Well, don't you ever ask a friend to pray for you? Don't you ever ask the preacher to pray for you? And all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but we, but God, we can go straight to God. Amen. Okay? And I, I think that they probably believe you can do that too. I'm not saying, you know, because they do pray to the Father, uh, but it sure seems like they put a lot of emphasis on just praying to popes and praying to saints and praying to Mary, and there's the main elevated uh, one. Okay, so let me get into this uh, real quickly and show you a little bit more why they elevate her to the extent that they do according to Catholic dogma. Okay, so there's basically three dogmas of Mariology, okay? And this is just teachings that are established in the Catholic Church throughout history, eventually whenever someone establishes it as a dogma, then they have to believe it. It's basically how, how I understand it anyway. Number one, the Immaculate Conception. Now, if you're like me, the first time you found out what the Immaculate Conception actually meant, you were shocked. Because when I was growing up and I heard Immaculate Conception, here's what I thought that meant. Virgin birth. <laughs> This is, what I, this is what I thought. Maybe it's just my own ignorance. But I thought the Immaculate Conception was just Mary being a virgin and giving birth to Jesus, the Word of God, you know, God with us, Emmanuel. The Immaculate Conception isn't about 
Jesus at all. The Immaculate Conception says that, that Mary was born without sin. She had no original sin, and she never sinned. They believe that she is she is ever without sin. Uh, she was she was never she she never had any sin. So if you remember when I defined how Catholics teach about salvation, they believe that first of all, because we're the sons of Adam, we're born with this original sin. A lot of Protestants teach that too. Okay. Now, could you say that we're all we're all born into sin? Well, in a manner of speaking, because the Bible says that in in Adam. You know, all, all are sinners, okay? In fact, where is that? I think I wrote that down because I knew I'd forget. Look at Romans uh, 5, 12. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, and that men there, this is men and women. I think everybody understands that, right? Uh, all men, for that all have sinned. Right? So, so here's the big question everybody asks. Do I sin because I'm a sinner, or am I a, a sinner because I sin? Which is kind of just one of those philosophical, just like scratch your head and sit around and think about it all day. But like here's what the Bible says, that we're all sinners because we've all sinned. We all deserve to go to hell because we've all sinned. You can say, yeah, well, it's not my fault. It's Adam's fault. It was, it, it's your fault because you sinned. Okay? And so the Bible says that in Adam, we all sin. Why? Because we're human flesh. And anyone that says that they didn't sin is a liar. The Bible makes that very clear. It says all men, meaning all mankind, man, woman, and earth. And they're like, well, except for Mary. <laughs> right? She's the only human. And you can understand where they developed this doctrine because they said, you know what? How could a sinful person have Jesus in their womb? Because, I mean, he, he took on a human body. But he was without sin. But he was in the womb of a, of a sinful woman. And I know that would make me a heretic in their eyes to say that she was sinful. But I believe wholeheartedly that she was not without sin. Okay, And if she was without sin, she wouldn't have died. Which, I'll get to that in just a minute. <laughs> okay, So, this... Dogma of the Immaculate Conception is surprising to a lot of people, but it's actually saying that Mary was free of sin. She had no sin. Now you can see why they venerate her and put her up on a higher level than any of the saints or, or popes or anybody uh, because they think that she was without sin. And so surely she can get a hold of God. This wasn't accepted, interestingly enough, until 1854 by Pope Pius IX. So when... Pope Pius X became Pope. Who do you think he named himself after? All right. So you can see that the, the society of the of Saint Paul, uh, Saint Pius X, you know, really big deal that they held to this doctrine and really believe in the Immaculata. Right. They really believe in Mary and Our Lady, and you're going to see a lot about that and hear a lot about that. It wasn't accepted until 1854 about the Immaculate Conception. Until then, I'm not saying that they never talked about that. You can go way back early on in church history, people talked about that. But it wasn't until 1854 where this guy said, yeah, it's a doctrine. We have to hold to this doctrine. All right? The Bible makes it clear, all have sinned. Mary herself acknowledged in Luke chapter 1 her need for a Savior. Let's look at their Luke chapter 1. Now, I suppose this would be easy to explain away by somebody who is a devout Catholic, but to me it's very clear. Acts chapter 1, verse 46. This is after Elizabeth, you know, John the Baptist, uh, uh, jumps in her womb, and she basically is, is, is uh, praising uh, Mary, not worshiping her, but just praising, like, hey, blessed, you're, you're blessed to be able to carry the, uh, the Savior. And so here's what Mary says in verse 46. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Well, what does she need saving from? Same thing everybody needs saving from. She needs saving from her sins that are going to send her to hell. She did go to hell. She, all right, she was, she was saved, but it's because she put her faith in the, the work of her son and, and the, him being the son of God, him being the promised one. She 
kept those things in her heart, and she remembered, and she, and she put her faith in him. But she needed a savior, just like we all do. Okay, number two. And the last two, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, so, uh, so don't worry uh, about the time. Second dogma of Mariology is the, the perfect, I mean, sorry, perpetual virginity of Mary. Okay, they believe that she was a virgin before Jesus. We agree with that. But then they believe that she remained a virgin after Jesus was born. And so what's the problem with that? Well, it, it goes against scripture, for one thing. And it's something that they just had to make that because it, it just it just fits in what they want to live. And again, they can probably go back to some early uh, uh, church fathers, quote unquote, and and uh, and find out where they talked about this. Um, I think maybe even one of the apocrypha, probably Gospel of James or whatever. I, I can't remember, but I think one of those might mention something that they run with and say, "See, she was a she was." A, I don't have time to talk about the Apocrypha right now, but look, the Apocrypha, if the Apocrypha is, and again, they didn't know, nobody necessarily accepted it into the canon of Scripture, but if the Apocrypha was true, then there's a lot of discrepancies in the Bible, contradictions in the Bible, because the Apocrypha has, has got all kinds of errors, and, and it doesn't agree with other parts of Scripture that we know are inspired by God, and so uh, the thing about the Apocrypha books is that they're they're in that category for a reason, okay? Because they're not uh, they're 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 pseudo books. They're not real. Somebody just made these up, you know, and they took some doctrine and some teachings and they added to that and they and they and they built off of that. And I'm convinced of that. Okay, so uh, so the <clears throat> perpetual virginity of Mary. Let's look at a couple passages real quick. Matthew chapter one. Verse 24. Matthew 21, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife. Look at verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Why is till important? Because it means that she didn't remain a virgin. <laughs> she knew not her husband. She didn't have sexual, sexual intercourse with her husband until she brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus. By the way, firstborn son, Jesus. But anyway, look at, uh, look at Matthew chapter 13. I haven't looked at uh, the, their Bible and see how it's translated in their Bible. I would suspect it's still there, though. Matthew 13, look at verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, and Joses, and Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? And so, right there, and I won't go to the other places, but uh, Mark 6, 3, Galatians 1, 19 talks about it, Acts 1, 12 through 14, these all mention these brothers of Christ again. And, uh, and you know what they'll say? Is, well, it says brother in there, but really the Greek word means cousin. Well, one big problem I have with that is Elizabeth is called her cousin. right? And there's other places where the Bible talks about cousin. So if they can use that word to mean cousin or brother, then why did they use a cousin? You know what I mean? Why did they, they use that word for a brother for cousin? And other? Does that make sense what I'm saying? All right. So so I think it's very clear he had brothers, but they were half brothers because uh, you know, he didn't share their father. Okay? Uh, he was, Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost. And so I could go on about that but again, this is a this is one. This is actually established early on. This was established in 553 A.D. And so uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary. So we have the immaculate conception, perpetual virginity of Mary. We have the third one, which I'm not hardly even going to talk about. The mother of God, 
the Theotokos. I guess I did right there. And they're saying the God bearer. All right, I'm not going to make a big deal about that. Like, I personally don't like that title, the mother of God, but what they're saying is that Jesus was God. And even though he was, you know, we can read John 1, he was with the Father and he was God, but then he became a man in the flesh because he was in the womb, became God with us. All they were doing is fighting against some teachings that taught that God wasn't really, I mean, that, that, uh, uh, that Jesus wasn't really God. Okay, and so we would obviously agree with them on that. I just don't like the title, but that's that's fine. I'm not going to make a big deal about the mother of God. And then the fourth dogma of the church is the assumption of Mary, meaning that they believe that she never died. They believe that she just, I don't know if you could compare it to like Enoch or Elijah, uh, where they just went to be with the Lord. The problem with that is that there's absolutely no records that, whether eyewitnesses or there's some kind of proof or anything uh, that said they're like, there's some kind of story that was, where Thomas apparently said, hey, let's dig up Mary's body or let's go to the tomb or whatever and see Mary, or he wanted the body of Mary or something like that. And when they went there, they said, oh, she's not there. And so there's one story, there's different ver versions of the story. And again, some of this has to do with disputes that they had over time, uh, exactly what happened. It wasn't until 1950 that they pronounced this as a doctrine in the church. So we're talking about a really new, recent uh, uh, doctrine that they're told to, told to believe. But that is this belief that they believe, and again, some people think this took place in Ephesus. I don't know why she ended up in Ephesus, but they say that you know she was in the home, and there she was just taken to be with the Lord. Others say that she was buried, but it was kind of like Jesus. She resurrected and they say that she just went straight to uh, straight to heaven, you know. And so here's the thing about that. <laughs> Number one, Jesus is the only person who has ever died and resurrected. Amen. Okay. Jesus is the only person who ever went to heaven without dying. <laughs> okay, now, and, and so uh, he did die physically, but... But you know what I mean? He resurrected and he went to be born. The only one. You say, well, what about Enoch? What about uh, what about Elijah? I'm going to tell you what happened to them on their way up to heaven. Their bodies burned up in the atmosphere and they died. And their soul went to be with the Lord. That's the only explanation I have. Because there's no way that there, there's Jesus, Elijah, and Enoch, and Mary. They're the only ones with bodies in heaven. And everybody else is a soul, right? And they're just the only bodies. And they're waiting on the resurrection where we're going to go to be with the Lord. And I'll prove that to you. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, and then I'm done. 1 Corinthians 15. So he said, well, yeah, but they didn't never taste of death. They just went to go be with the Lord. Well, you have to really read how the Bible says it, because it never, it never says the way that people really claim, you know, that Elijah and Enoch went to be with the Lord. Uh, it doesn't actually, you know, describe it the way that a lot of people talk about it. But all it says is that they just were not. Like, they were there, and then they were gone. And you can say the same thing about Mary, but then that really changes a lot of what they're teaching about how she went to go be with the Lord. Okay, but we know that she didn't go to be with the Lord in the same way that Jesus went to be with the Lord. And that is proven right here in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, right, mankind all died. It's appointed that a man wants to die after this judgment. But now, let's see, I missed my place here. Uh, for since by man came death, by man, talking about Jesus, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all men shall all be made alive but every man in his own order jesus the first fruits afterward them that are christ at his coming there's not going to be a resurrection of the dead until christ comes back and until christ comes back there's not anybody that's going to rise and go be with the lord in a resurrected body because jesus is the first fruits and he's the only one that's done that until his coming when he comes back, then he'll take us. Okay, when he comes back, what's, 
when he comes back, he's going to resurrect Mary from the dead. Her soul's in heaven, right? But her body is somewhere. You know, her body is, you know, you say, well, does it exist anymore? Probably not. It's probably disintegrated. There's a lot of people who have been cremated, a lot of people who, uh, you know, have just eroded to the point where you, there's no evidence left of their body existing. We're talking about uh, 6,000 years of history. <laughs> okay, people are gone. There are people who, uh, you know, burned up in fire or, or, or whatever the case. You know, but when the Lord comes back, God's going to give those those bodies back. I don't know how it works. God knows where all the atoms are. He knows how to put them back together. And he's going to give everybody a glorified body in his perfection with no uh, none of the effects of sin in our DNA. And he's going to raise people. He knows your DNA. He can just create you from nothing, I, I suppose. You're the exact DNA and just put it all back together. Don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. Enoch's going to come back. Elijah's going to come back. Mary's going to come back. And then we'll, re at, in the re we'll be in the resurrection and we'll go to be with the Lord. But I don't believe in the assumption of Mary. I don't believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. I don't believe in the immaculate conception. That's their lady. That's not our lady. Now, I have utter respect for, for Mary. I would love to meet her in heaven. Uh, you know, I, would, I, would, I believe she's blessed. I believe there's a wonderful story uh, you would like to sit around and listen to her tell. Now, I want to ask her about, you know, what it was like whenever she was, when she thought that she lost Jesus. <laughs> and he was in the temple, and she's like, oh, no, I lost Jesus. And uh, I, I would love to sit down and talk with her, but I'm not going to do anything that even looks close to venerating or worshiping her. Okay, And so that's a big problem I have with the Catholic uh, Church, and we're going to see that everywhere, I believe, when we go to... Uh, St. Mary's. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, salvation and the plan that was uh, established, Christ slain from the foundations of the world. I thank you, Lord, that you did, uh, you did uh, come off down to earth and be with man and used uh, Mary as a virgin uh, to, to, to be the, the mother of the man Jesus Christ. And uh, although I do believe he's fully God and he's fully man, I don't believe that changed anything about the human nature of Mary. And, uh, and Father, I pray that you just help us to put the proper adoration, the proper worship and praise on Jesus Christ. And you said uh, uh, that, that he glorified his name above all else. And you said that at the name of Jesus, uh, all men will bow. And there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Pray, Lord, that you just help us to put that focus where it needs to be and uh, help uh, many Catholics who've been deceived and, and uh, going the wrong way on that, misunderstanding that, help them to understand and come to uh, the truth. And I pray you help us to be alike and to plant some seeds and, and do our part. And we certainly don't think that we're better than anybody and, and if it weren't by somebody giving us the gospel, we wouldn't know any better either. But I pray that you help us to do that in such a way that that it would make sense and that uh, the, your word, of course, wouldn't go void and, and you would work in their hearts through the Holy Spirit and, and help convince them of their need to trust in Jesus alone and not to worry about, uh, about their sin and sending them to hell if they're in Jesus Christ. I pray you bless the rest of this night, bless the uh, food of our receive, and uh, look for us in Jesus' name.